Hello and welcome to the special edition of the Under Centre podcast. I'm your host, Darren Maher, and today we are going to talk about the life of Jim Duncan. Jim was a cornerback and kickoff returner for the Baltimore Colts for the majority of his career. He was part of the Colts team that won Super Bowl V in 1971 against the Dallas Cowboys. The Super Bowl, though, was the height of his career because teams seemed to go downhill uh, as soon as that game ended. On the show today to talk about Jim Duncan's life and his mysterious death while in a police station is Brett McCormick. Brett is the creator of Return Man. It's an eight-part podcast documentary series that looks at Jim's life. Brett, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Dara. Appreciate it. No problem at all. No problem at all. Uh, just before we get into the show, guys, if you are watching us on YouTube, can you please like this video and subscribe to the Dynamo Podcast Network? It'll really help us out and it will help grow the uh, followership and help Irish podcasts too. So uh, first things first on the podcast, Brett, what made you want to look into the life of Jim Duncan? Yeah, so I stumbled upon his story while there was a... Uh restaurant in the area that I was working in that um, like where I was working it's called Rock Hill South Carolina it's near Charlotte is the big city and um, it's known for um, producing NFL players like it's a small town but has like an outsized presence in the NFL and there was a local restaurant owner that was trying to make like kind of like a shrine so to speak, to these NFL players, you know, like with their jerseys and stuff. And he was checking with me, wanted to make sure he had the right list, you know, that he had everybody. So I was double checking for him. I thought I knew everybody, but I was just, um, you know, double checking to make sure we didn't offend somebody by leaving them off the wall. And uh, I went through this uh, website. You probably know it, uh, uh, profootballreference.com. It's a great website. Um, And so I was looking for players from the state of South Carolina. I was going down this list and it was uh, chronologically ordered. And I saw Jim Duncan from Lancaster, uh, South Carolina, which was in our coverage area. He wasn't one I was like, familiar with. And then uh, it also had the um, age, like their uh, lifespan or something like that. And, you know, it said uh, like 1946 to 72. And that like caught my eye. Okay. It was like pretty young when he died. So I just Googled his name. And uh, his Wikipedia page came up. And uh, if you look at like, at that point, I haven't looked at it in a while, actually, I should check it out. But, um, you know, it was kind of uh, just a description of his football career. And then a really innocuous last sentence that said he died in the um, police station of his hometown with, a, you know, had fatally shot himself with a police officer's revolver, um, you know, which really um, made the I don't know if the hair on the back of my neck stood up, but it like, uh, you know, my antenna were uh, up. And so that kind of like started it all. I was started looking for his family to see if he had family in the area still. Um, I found some of them and then uh, his brother was interested in at least talking to me. Um, And so from there, it just sort of took off. And that was in um, March, 2017 was the first time I talked to Elroy, Jim Duncan's um, younger brother in person and Elroy lives in Charlotte, which is where I live. And um, that kind of started this four year process, nearly four year process of, uh, of, of doing this project. Yeah. And, and Jim, like you're saying, was born in, in Lancaster, South Carolina in, in 1946 to a single mother. He was uh, the oldest of seven, uh, I believe. Um he was he was a player actually played all sides of the ball early in his career. He actually played offense as well as defense and special teams. I think he was, he was a a quarterback for a while, but he sort of when he realized he had the pace to get away from defenders, I think uh, he started to be returned. And his brother actually ended up one of his brothers ended up being a quarterback himself as well. That you mentioned in one of the early episodes. Um, goes to Maryland uh, Eastern Shore College and is drafted in the fourth round by the Baltimore Colts. The odd thing, though, that modern football fans may not uh, know about this in, in, in the year that he was drafted, there was 17 rounds in that draft. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, um, there was, I it, it was like an era when pro sports was not as pro, you know, so they say, you know, so they're drafting a lot of guys that like 
instant almost instantly are falling through you know like they just realize they got a job at a bank that's like you know a better job or whatever so um also the rosters were something like 40 players at that time so it's weird that they had actually less roster spots and you know uh to like what 60 something percent more rounds or something out of my math is probably terrible there but um you know it, it uh that was I don't know, to, to be drafted in the fourth round out of 17 was, was pretty good. I mean, the school that he went to um, had produced a lot of NFL players, like guys that I think nowadays would have gone to, you know, like the SEC, like, um, you know, big Southern schools that at that time didn't uh, didn't take black football players. So uh, they all ended up at Maryland State College, which is now Maryland Eastern Shore, and they actually don't even have a football team anymore. So um, it was like a pretty unique um time in my like college and pro football history. I mean, I think that uh, Maryland State College was sort of like a sanctuary for them, you know, kind of a safer place in a, I don't know, a country that was really going through a lot of upheaval. And even Maryland's Eastern Shore um, is really rural and like a lot like the American South um, and not always the friendliest to black people. So even there, it was, uh, you know, I think their college and their football program was sort of a uh, like a refuge for them yeah and, and it, obviously at a time where it, there was segregation in terms of schooling too and this was a, 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 obviously an all, an all black college like you're saying they had the, the the comfort of going to a place where they know they I guess you could say that they were they knew they were going to be accepted yeah and uh like mostly safe I mean you know like there could always be something really excessive happened but yeah generally like accepted and, and just kind of allowed to to be you know which um I mean there was one guy I talked to um and he was in the podcast Jeff Beaver uh, who played football at the University of North Carolina and uh he said that when he played with uh Jim Duncan on the Harrisburg Capital Colts the the minor league team for the Baltimore Colts uh, that was the first time he had played with black players and um, so he came from UNC, which is a big, you know, big school in the Atlantic Coast Conference. So um, I thought that was interesting. And it was, you know, it was like a, he had fond memories of that experience because it was, you know, like eye opening for him or I don't know about eye opening, but like it, it kind of expanded his horizons to, to um, you know, interact with black people in a normal way instead of, um, you know, something so fraught like it would have normally been like, you know, remember the Titans or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it mentioned as well that they would actually play games uh, on the, uh, the the white players' field as well, um, too. So th- th- there was sort of, when it came to football especially, and you know, when it came to sports, there was a little more sort of leeway given. Yeah, you definitely see that too with the um, Colts when he gets in the NFL. You know, because uh, when Jim arrives at the Colts in 1968. I mean, Baltimore, that's one of the, you know, worst years in Baltimore's history. I mean, they had huge riots that stemmed from the Martin Luther King assassination, uh, literally huge chunks of the city that were burned down. Um, and, you know, he just shows up in the middle of that. And, uh, but like the Colts, but if you were a Baltimore Colt, like you were, you were good you know, with, with anybody, I mean, people would buy beers and stuff. And so it, it is, I think it is informative to how uh, white America has accepted black people that, you know, entertain them or play sports. Um, there, there's as long as they don't, you know, get out of line or kneel for an anthem or something like that. I mean, that's, that's really been, um, it's been that way for a long time that people could uh, stomach other people that they didn't, you know, normally like. Uh, as long as they were averaging 35 yards of kick return. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, after being drafted by the Colts in 68, he started out with the Capital Colts. So I guess there it's maybe the equivalent of the practice squad that we see nowadays, although it did mm-hmm. include semi-professional and professional players at the time. Yeah, there's there's really not a great equivalent for it right now because, I mean, you had like a – you had a full team, so – the Capital Colts really only had like five or six guys that had any kind of remote future with Baltimore Colts. I mean, everybody else was pretty much to make up the numbers. So 
we, d- we don't really have a, an equivalent of it today. I've always kind of wondered like if the XFL or, you know, some other league would sort of serve as that uh, minor league for the NFL. But, you know, I think it, I, I think it's, I think like new football leagues are kind of hesitant to be subservient to the NFL, like right out of the gate, even though in the long run, that would be a smarter business plan. Um, because there's a, you know, there's a lot of NFL players that don't make it uh, or a, a lot of college football players that, you know, just don't make it. And, and because there's not enough spots. So, um, but these guys they played with, I mean, all had day jobs and, you know, uh, you know, worked nine to five and then, uh, they may and they maybe practice like once or twice a week, um, you know, because the the five or six I mentioned would practice with the Baltimore Colts during the week, and then they would go down with that team on the weekend. So, um, you know, nobody was making any money uh, off of it really, but it was it was good reps for uh, Jim Duncan, especially because when he was there, he was tearing it up, you know, based on what I um, found in their newspaper. So he was, you know, ran some kicks back and was was getting a lot of playing time, which. Uh, he wouldn't have gotten with the uh, Baltimore Colts because at that point they had a really experienced um, defensive secondary. And so there wasn't, there just wasn't going to be any run for him. And again, remember he was basically switching from quarterback to the uh, defensive secondary, which is not a position he had played all that much um, before the NFL, but that's uh, again, (laughs) there's a lot of racial components to the story and, you know, there just weren't black quarterbacks at that time. So really, um, black quarterbacks almost always got switched to another position. Uh, you still see some of that these days when, you know, somebody thinks a, a black quarterback, um, you know, isn't going to make it at, at QB at the, well, you know, he can just switch to wide receiver or whatever, cause he's probably athletic enough. So, I mean, that, 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 uh, idea persists, but, um, you know, it was really almost gospel at that, at that point in time, it just, it just didn't happen. So, so he, that was good for him cause he was, you know, learning a new position and, uh, and, uh, got a lot of uh, reps to be able to do that yeah and the like the way you describe him there as well and and from the episodes that that i listened to as well that he mentioned you mentioned that he was fairly snappy dresser he was quite fashion conscious he had the you know he was the one with the the puma boots with the with the white mm-hmm. trim on them you know he he had the the flashy cars you know he sort of was he sort of in my head, compared him to a modern day player that actually spent a good chunk of his time in Carolina as well. And that would have probably been Cam Newton. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about that, but it could yeah. be. Um, yeah, especially, no, I, I think like, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, especially like, like you just said, that he was a quarterback beforehand and he might play. So if he was playing nowadays, he probably would have continue to be a quarterback who was quite mobile who could mm-hmm. run who held the ball like he had shovel hands to hold the ball like cam does yeah. nowadays mm-hmm. yeah yeah that, that wag the ball wags the ball around a lot when yeah. he runs and like yeah you think of all those touchdowns that cam newton scored when he's put the ball out into space but it's never you know never touched down or anything yeah. um yeah it could have been I, th- I think um like one of the like real uh overarching a- overarching aspects of him was uh like you met came from a, a family with a single mother and he was the oldest of, uh, you know, this, this like massive siblings. And, uh, and I, I think that he really relished um, having more money than he knew what to do with, you know, and not like he was rich or anything. I mean, he wasn't, wasn't making like crazy money, but it was just, he uh, like probably for the first time in his life was not, um, you know, wanting really for anything. And so I think there was like a, like a zest for life or whatever and and fashion was definitely something he um you know was interested in and looking good and you know it's hard to say what like a poor upbringing does for your psychology like people you know people react to that very differently but I think for him it was you know to embrace and enjoy what he what he finally could um and there's a lot of other you know evidence of that as you as you know if you listen to the podcast uh you know as far as being what we would probably consider kind of wasteful when he went out to eat. Um, but it was because he could. And, you know, for the first time in his life, he wasn't, wasn't uh, having to think about it. Yeah. There's definitely some stories in the podcast about uh, what he did when he had money as well, which, which were very good. And uh, I'll leave people to listen to the podcast to find out those stories because it's definitely worth listening to sort of how he would spend his money. But let's talk about the, the 1970, 71 season, the, the 
it was actually that year the Colts were under new management as well because the the coach that drafted uh, Jim had gone um, Jim uh, Ursa uh, had gone to Miami. So it was rookie head coach Don McCaffrey who took over that year. And they were obviously trying to avenge um, the Super Bowl loss they had a couple of years previous to the Jets, where it was a real surprise. Obviously, Jets led by Joe Name at that time. So they they make it to Miami and the Super Bowl, where, of course, they face the Cowboys, like I mentioned at the start. And sort of they lose their their veteran quarterback Johnny Unitas there I think it was a rib injury or a punctured lung as well from now I watched some of the video of the game back Mm -hmm. and it was a pretty stiff shot he took to the ribs for sure but they battled back and Doug himself actually um, in four returns had uh, 90 yards in, in the game including a fumble as well, I should say, mm-hmm. too. He had a pretty bad fumble there as well at one point in the game, too. But, you know, it's it was such a, a big moment for the Colts to avenge that that Super Bowl loss to the Jets by winning this one. Yeah, it was a weird game. It was like one of the worst Super Bowls ever. I think there was like 11 combined turnovers or something like that. And uh, just uh, really sloppy. It was the first game ever played on AstroTurf. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but um, you know, the first game you're going to play on a surface where the ball bounces a lot and the ball was bouncing a lot. Um, and yeah, it, uh, we, I think, I think one description in the podcast initially we had Duncan like described as a Super Bowl hero. And then we thought we should maybe like dial that back because I don't know that he was the hero. I mean, he, he played okay. He started and he actually did a good job on, uh, he was covering Bob Hayes who's a, you know, all-time great wide receiver from the Cowboys and who did nothing in that game as most other people did nothing. He did uh, but one he didn't like thing. It. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. there. He, he did one thing. He tipped the ball away from Duncan, giving him a chance to intercept it before it was intercepted. Nice. <laughs> because I remember You did watching, your homework, Daryl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was all set to intercept that ball, but it was tipped away from him by the wide receiver. Yeah, and then even the touchdown that Mackey scored, John Mackey scored, uh, was also tipped. I mean, the whole, the whole game was just a kind of a sloppy mess, but uh, no. And then Duncan had the, was credited with the key fumble recovery as um, Cowboys were about to score late in the game. Although you've seen the video and probably read about it. I mean, the really didn't look like he even got near the ball, <laughs> no. but they gave it to him. So, you know, that's where we were like, is he the hero or is he just, you know, we'll, we'll go with the, he played a big role. <laughs> so that was a safer way to put it. <laughs> definitely, definitely played played a big role. And just from watching the game, man, uh, I encourage people to actually have a look at it just to see if you've never seen Jim Duncan play, just watch because you look at him when he gets the ball, you think he's about a foot taller than every other player. The speed mm-hmm. alone from him as well on that field too. He, uh, If you can watch other games as well, when he can break off uh, away from a couple of tackles, you won't catch him. He's like a taller Tyreek Hill, you could probably guess with his speed. You know, you're not going to, you're not, you're not going to catch him at all. But, you know, it, like you were saying, it's such a strange game. And I kind of, in researching for this, I watched, um, you know, the NFL do their like America's game for each Super Bowl. And mm-hmm. they talked about this one. And, what I got from every cult player who was interviewed for that was they didn't feel like it was a win because they were still hung up on the Jets loss. Yeah. And they, and they played so badly. Apparently I thought that was a, that was interesting. I, I, I thought that was like a weird vibe because uh, so, I mean, for people who don't know in 68, um, Joe Namath, you know, made this like big claim that the Jets, who were like enormous underdogs, that was that Colts team, uh, you know, had like a really tremendous defense and were huge favorites in the Super Bowl. And they they just laid an egg. They just like played terribly and lost to the Jets. And uh, you know, it was know, actually they, a game. That, sorry to interrupt. It was actually a game yeah. also that Johnny Unitas left early in too. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. point. Earl Morrill, both times was the was the guy that came in, but. Yeah. Um, no, I think uh, I think because they played so badly that it, it just didn't feel like they had really avenged that defeat. But I mean, I thought they were being hard on themselves because I mean, if you win, you win. You know, I mean, it was a it was an ugly game, but like they they still got the ring, you know, and they still won. But um, there were I don't know, maybe they held themselves to some sort of 
higher standard or something. I, I, I would have lo- loved to have known what Jim Duncan felt about it, you know, because I never really saw his reaction to it. Um, yeah. I could promise you that, you know, guys like him that were not on that 68 team. I mean, he was on that team, but he didn't play in the game you know, probably were excited to win the Super Bowl regardless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And especially for him, it would have been his first Super Bowl. Like, mm-hmm. You probably couldn't say that he was that, like if you want to say, because he couldn't count that game against the Jets because he would have been, it was only the year he was drafted. So you could just yeah. say that, look, listen, I was a rookie, we'll let it go. But I saw, like, I, I purposely sort of looked out to see, especially for the the kick that won the game um, and just to see the reaction. And, it was sort of a, a strange reaction. Like he sort of ran over to the other players celebrating, but it looked as if he felt like he had to, if you know what I mean. I don't know if he was overly excited himself. I who knows? I mean, it's hard, it was kind of hard to to get the vibe there. You know, like uh, like maybe it was more like relief or something. I'm, awesome. I'm not really sure. That, that was a no. You're right. It was kind of a weird thing, and like the um. You know, you got Unitas over there. Could probably like barely breathe. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, it, w- it was a it was a weird vibe. I, I I wouldn't really be able to say. I guess what what they were thinking after that, especially Jim Duncan. You know, a lot of people never knew what he was thinking. Yeah, and it just shows the uh, advances in modern medicine as well. That for the whole game or the whole second half that Johnny Unitas was out, he just had an ice pack under his rib for the whole <laughs> thing. It could have been broken. It could have been a punctured lung. But now he was sitting there with an ice pack for the rest of the game and just watching the rest of it for sure no hospital no medical treatment no there's some there are some horror stories that were shared with me uh you know in, in working on this thing i mean like uh rick volk told me a really a really bad one he uh was a safety um he played on the side of the field that duncan played on so like they were you know interacted a lot during the game you know kind of telling each other where to be and stuff um and it was in that super bowl that they lost to the jets where they scored late and they were trying to onside kick to try to get the ball back uh, in time running down. And he just got like crushed in the head um, as the ball came like right to him. And he kind of like ducked down and just got pounded and he was out cold and two guys came out and like, basically like dragged him off the field um, and they got the game underway. Uh, Cause like, I guess they weren't really waiting around for him to yeah. <laughs> come off the field, but he told me that he never had any, uh, he didn't think he really had any long-term effects from it because it was the last game of the season. And then he had like four months that, you know, four or five months where he didn't do anything. So I think he was able to have like some natural recovery time. Whereas if there had been, you know, another game or two or whatever after it, you know, that it could have really caused, cause issues for him. I feel like. Yeah. And that, at that time, obviously there was no sort of really like right. head injury assessments. Like if you were right. fine, this, the next game you, you were good and, I, in the podcast, players mentioned too that they had actually maybe got concussed, played the next play, and they're seeing two footballs being thrown at a time, you know? So it's just, I think it was definitely the way it was, the way it, the game was played at that time. But moving on then from the Super Bowl, like I mentioned at the start, as soon as the final whistle goes, it seems as though his career kind of goes in a tailspin. Um, at the start of the 71-72 season, he gets injured in preseason and he sort of never really recovers from that. He's then traded to the Saints and was waived before the start of the season. Um, then was given a trial by the Dolphins uh, and was subsequently then uh, waived a couple of days after that too. Um, then the sort of personal trauma sort of starts to come to light there a little bit. You know, drugs start become an issue. Um, I think it was mentioned that um, marijuana and heroin were definitely the two drugs that people thought that um, Jim used the most. Yeah. Um, so I would say, like, I would back up a little bit. So the, right after the Super Bowl, they... Uh, went to the Bahamas, the team owner paid for a trip for them. And I was trying to find out more information about that trip because I could picture that would have been really the apex for him, you know, sitting on the beach, $15,000 Super Bowl victory bonus, which was equal to his year salary. Um, And, you know, just chilling on the beach, having drinks and soaking it up. And at that point from there, you know, you could see where it goes downhill. So, um, it sounds like he 
started to get into heroin somehow um, in the summer of 71. It's not entirely clear. And I, I had one person that confirmed that and that a bunch of other people that thought it and like had a suspicion about it. So um, I feel, you know, pretty strongly that he was, but, you know, it, it, it would have been better to have more sources for sure. I would have felt better about it, but it, like, I think it was definitely a problem for him. Um, it's possible that he got into it through like painkillers or something like that. I mean, um, one player, former player told me that uh, their trainer, their team trainers and team doctors have like a fishing tackle box, you know, full of like each little um, section with a different color pill. And basically you could grab whatever you wanted. So there was, um, this was a couple years before the NFL started drug testing. That was like the mid seventies. Um, so this just was a very different climate. Again, when you talk about concussions, this was the same thing. It was just not really something they worried about. I mean, at that point, you know, football players were really kind of uh, just used, you know, so to speak. I mean, they were there to produce and whatever it took to do that is what happened. Um, so it's possible that happened um, or, you know, even that he just was willing to try stuff and, you know, being a recreational drug user, I, I definitely smoke weed um, that, you know, he tried other things and maybe got, you know, in a little bit too deep. Um, so that 71 season was pretty much a wash. It's hard to say if that was heroin related completely or, or what. I mean, there were a lot of other things that were going on at the same time. Um, and like that, those injuries in the preseason, you know, if you think about it, you're coming off a Super Bowl season and, and he himself had a year that really had established himself as like a future, probably decently long term NFL starter, you know the last thing you want to have happen in next preseason is you injure your ankle and you miss the whole um, start of the year. So, so it just never, that really was metaphoric and they just never got, never got right after that. Um, Then after that season, which was a dud and kind of a dud for the team too, they they sort of uh, underachieved a little bit, I think Um, they got a new general manager. And uh, when he came in, there was a picture of him with a broom (laughs) <laughs> and he basically was cleaning house. So the Colts had gotten a little bit old. Um, Duncan didn't really fit that, you know, um, description. I think he was like 25 at the time, but um, he ended up getting traded to New Orleans. And um, there's a lot of, uh, it's not clear why he got traded because, you know, if, if they're trying to kind of have like a youth movement, you know, get rid of Johnny Unitas and people like that, but it makes sense because they're, you know, older. Um, he wasn't older. So, you know, there had to be something else there that, uh, they didn't feel like they could trust him or, you know, he wasn't performing or whatever, you know, it's hard to say what they knew, um, because it's not very clear. Uh, and so he ended up getting traded to New Orleans and, you know, by that point, that was the spring of 72. And I would say things were not going very well for him. Um, he was back in Lancaster and, and, you know, it's, not really clear if he was using drugs there. Uh, Well, I'm sure he was smoking weed, but not um, harder drugs. Um, Also seemed to like really be unsure if he wanted to keep playing. And this is where the head injury stuff really comes into play and and seems to be become more of a factor too, because his personality and uh, his behavior kind of become inconsistent with what it had been previously. So he starts acting weirdly. Um, could also say maybe drugs, but, um, you know, it's, it makes sense um, based on some of the stories I was told that other things were involved besides just drugs. Um, and so the Saints actually sent their coaches up to uh, Lancaster to, like, I think, like, feel him out, see, like, kind of where his head was at. Um, and they had, they gave him an advance on, uh, on his uh, – I think it was a, an advance on a bonus he would get if he like led the league in kickoff return yardage or something like that. And so that sort of speaks to he was having some money trouble at the time too. So like all this stuff was just coming to a head, um, really a confluence of events that would be difficult for, I think, anybody to deal with, um, especially somebody that, you know, was, was uh, in his situation. So um yeah, so he went to the Saints training camp, and again, he got, you know, wasn't in great shape. He got injured again, um, and then things just fell apart, and he wound up back in Lancaster in the, uh, September of 1972, and that ultimately was the worst thing that could have ever happened to him. 
Yeah. Do do we know though in in your research? Do you do you have any sort of injuries before the ankle uh, after the Super Bowl that you obviously you get the odd injury that that happened, but anything sort of severe because. Yeah, like you're saying, it's sort of when that happens is when things start to go a little downhill. Now it could have been like you're saying the Bahamas ship, but you know that sort of sense when you're 24, 25, 26, and you get your first serious injury, and then you realize you're human. Maybe that could happen, and he just didn't react well to it. Possibly, I don't know. So, uh, so another thing was um, they didn't have a in, they didn't publish injury reports. So you know when I. I was trying to find those when I was looking for um, uh, like games that he would have been held out to see if there was something to explain. And actually, I wasn't looking for his ankles. I was looking for his head. You know, not that it would have said he had a head injury, but I just was trying to find the games where he was um, clearly injured because what would happen is he was either in the box score or, or he wasn't, but it wouldn't say why, you know. Mm-hmm. And so when he stopped being in there for kickoff returns, that's where I was like, okay, well, he could have lost the kickoff return job which he did. I found that in articles, but um, also could have been because he didn't play the entire game. So it was really hard to say. So I, I don't, I don't really know. I think the, um, I also don't know if he came to that camp in like the best shape or whatever. I mean, because if that summary started using, you know, drugs that are like obviously quite detrimental to your health and, and like, I don't think, um, you have to be a drug expert to know that heroin is not a performance enhancer. You know, it's not a, it's not a drug that people take to do better at sports. Um, so you could see where that would be something that would uh, cause him issues in preparation and conditioning and things like that, maybe. So I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good uh, read on like what his injury history really was. I mean, you do have to consider when you're thinking about the head injury possibility, you do have to consider that uh, like you mentioned, he had played, so much football. I mean, just really like on both sides of the ball and special teams for years, you know, I mean, he just like, it seems like they're about an eight year stretch of his career where he like didn't come off the field, you know, from high school to the end of college. So that's a number of, you know, shots and hits that maybe were adding up very quickly for him. Um, it's hard to say, again, this is kind of um, educated speculation uh, was in a lot of the cases as good as I could do on this story. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I think it, it makes sense though, that that would be an issue for him, especially coming from a black school that wouldn't black schools that wouldn't have, um, the best equipment at that time. And not that uh, the equipment at that time could do much for head injuries anyway, but, um, no, I think, um, I always felt like, uh, his, um, brain injury, potential brain injury combined with, drug issue left his body like not ready for an NFL season if that makes sense I think that was yeah. sort of the, the combo that did him in yeah let's uh, let's jump forward then and let's talk about the 20th of October in 1972 uh, the day that ended up actually being the the day that Jim Duncan passed away um now you were mentioned in the podcast, and we won't go into too much detail about it. But around that time, he felt he was possibly being targeted for various reasons. Um, so can you kind of run me through the sort of t- a brief timeline of what happened on that day? Yeah. So um, basically, he took his uh, he took his mom to work. She worked at a liquor store. Uh, I, and then he like ran around it's Marin's like he he went to a gas station and asked for antifreeze for his car he drove like a little yellow punch bug um and then he went to a pawn shop and I uh, was in there like very briefly um and then somehow he ends up in the police station uh and you know according to the one witness that I spoke to um this guy George Lloyd who was actually like only in his second week on the job there. Um, he just walked in and they said, can I help you? And he just walked across the like lobby, you know, a little foyer and in, in, entrance to the place and um, just walked up to the, you know, guy and grabbed the gun and shot himself. And, and I mean, that's as much as we know. I mean, there's some, some, um, uh, there's speculation about different things that may have happened. And the, the biggest question for me was like, why was he even in there? 
um, it seemed very weird that somebody would kill himself uh, or would die by suicide in, uh, um, in a police station when I know that um, almost certain that he had access to a firearm. You know, a lot of people that's a private thing that they do. You know, it's not something that they always do publicly. Some people do it publicly. You never know. You don't want to mm -hmm. generalize about that. But um, yeah, so I mean, there just was a, it's a very weird story. I mean, it's the kind of story you hear that part of it right away. You're kind of like, that is unusual. Um, one side that could maybe, well, yeah, I mean, there's there's some theories of, of like why that could have happened. Um, and then there's the alternate theory that it didn't happen that way and that, that you know, there was something different that happened and it was sort of um, covered up or um, rearranged, like, so to speak. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. And, and and the officer's obviously gun that was in question. It, it's a bit weird because that you said yourself that it wouldn't normally be on show like it was that day or claimed to be like it was that day and it's normally put away and uh, and the thing that I find uh, I find crazy about listening to the the events of of the day itself as well was he, like you said he just walked in um he wasn't where like you know just just as you would hear from other cases or maybe other things that happened around at that time a civil rights era so when it comes to um a person dying it would normally be in police custody but this guy just walked in just for absolutely no reason he wasn't called there he wasn't under arrest or anything like that. he just walked in a free will he didn't say anything that's yeah. like that i thought that was really like eerie you know so i mean um i never knew what to make of that i mean you have to part of this you, you know you have to try to feel out um if people are being truthful or um you know kind of try to read people which is difficult to do over the phone um but i mean i, I don't know the way the way the guy told me the story was very you know methodical he rattled it right off and so i mean it kind of always kind of this this thing always came back to me is like the way you would look at it is really kind of revealing of just your general outlook i mean some people would look at this story and immediately think wow that's a sad that's a sad story but that's probably like exactly how it happened and other people would look at it and just be like no that's bullshit like there's no way that's what happened and so you know that's that's sort of how i'm interested to hear what people think about it because um i have kind of an inclination or i have a leaning of which way i think it happened but don't really know exactly mm -hmm. so um yeah you know yeah, and I think that's the, obviously the beauty of this podcast series that everyone's going to listen to what you say and they're going to come up with their own idea of what happened and what they think happened to, to Jim that day. And like, especially other things where so you spoke to his, his widow, Alice, and she had stories about she was told one thing and then another thing happened uh, as well. Um, straight, another thing that obviously aids itself to sort of conspiracy theorists is that 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 um the the police chief at the time uh was uh named by larry lower and um, he took over the investigation which for a chief a, a police chief who oversees a shooting in his own precinct to take over an investigation is not something you would normally see no it's it so there's a lot of stuff like that, that again, as a reporter or as the person listening, you have to sort of like suss out for yourself. Um, and so how much of this is corruption or a cover up and how much of it is a police department in a rural part of America in the 1970s that's really not very professionalized. Um, and that it was just bad police work so and also we think we're much more hyper attuned to the image of how things look these days and they like there was i would say in some ways a um uh reaction against that back then you know so like a, a lot of white people in power in the south or really anywhere in the united states didn't care how it looked you know and so that's an important part of it as well, is that 
there may not have been anything sketchy that was done, but the aftermath of it was just so callous and like careless. Uh, and by careless, I mean uncaring. Um, is that you know it it lends itself to thinking like wow they you know they really treated them badly afterwards you know they they treated the family badly they left them the reason I can even do this story fifty years later is because there's so many questions that aren't answered so that in itself like you have to ask yourself why is that the case was it again was it because it was a cover up and they didn't want the questions answered or is it because they just didn't give a shit and they like you know didn't feel like they owe this black family any answers or you know um it's hard to say yeah but there was sort of pressure to do an inquest and there was a public inquest done but it seemed to be more of something that was done for show to show that they actually did it rather than trying to get to the bottom of what happened yeah and i just finished saying that they didn't really care what people you know, thought of them or whatever, but this, in this case, that, yeah, you're right. That, I mean, that was, he, he said, uh, Chandler said, um, he only held the inquest because, you know, people were kind of in an uproar about it. I mean, they didn't even do an autopsy. It, it just was like a really, um, sloppy, you know, post-death situation, like the investigation and how it's done was just, you know, did, did not seem like it was intended to, uh, get to the bottom of anything and, and the inquest itself you guys still use inquests in Ireland don't you we do yeah yeah in the U.S. they got really uh, they went out of fashion because they're very uh, it can be very much a rubber stamp for the authorities you know it's really again it's sort of run by uh, Richard Chandler in this case who runs a record uh, service you know that like hauls cars that have crashed and stuff and and so he's the guy that the police call when there's a wreck so i mean he works very closely with these people i mean again like can you really expect him in a small town to be a hundred percent um objective i mean of course not so yeah it's kind of absurd to even think that so um it's not surprising that the inquest ended the way it did it's also uh um not a well understood um i was gonna say legal proceeding i guess that's what it is but it, it it's not a like a criminal thing or anything yeah i mean you really can't it's kind of like the thing you get out of it is a suggestion <laughs> you know it has like no no yeah. you don't have to follow it or it has no nobody goes to jail or anything it's just sort of a suggestion and so yes. really that you know it's it's kind of worthless <laughs> yeah sort of like a, a public dissection of yeah. the supposed facts of what happened but without coming to any sort of proper and conclusion that or that goes into the record books right like a yeah. binding thing that has to happen but, but in this case i mean you know you think if you wanted to do that i mean you would you know nobody heard from jim duncan's side i mean not that i don't know what they would have added really but um you know i think they could have stood up and said you know we don't think he did this because it's not who he is and that would have been important to have that out there you know i mean I don't yeah. know, it just, it just seemed weird that there was only one side that was talked to. Yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned that, that no one obviously had the chance to speak their side, but like I said, there's not much that probably they could add because of, they weren't there on the day that it happened. And right. um, they could give possibly, like, what did he call it, uh, character references. Um, yeah, like which, a testimonial for him. Right. Yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. But the thing is they, they say oh, he wouldn't be the type of person to do something like this but he not he wasn't the sort of person that people felt that they actually properly knew and especially i know you mentioned earlier with the a little earlier on with the head injuries but we, we've seen the development of cte over the last 10-15 years especially around nfl players and you know, if you look, look, obviously one example and probably one of the most famous examples is, is probably Mike Webster, uh, mm-hmm. former Steelers player. You know, the, and there is obviously an argument to be made that CTE could have been the one of the mitigating factors in in uh, Jim's passing. For sure. And I think, uh, like, here's one thing they could have done, and I checked on this, and I'm 99 point nine percent certain they could have done this is take the fingerprints off the gun because if his fingerprints were on there that really highly increases the likelihood that you know he was involved in 
his own death. Um, if his fingerprints were not on there, then that eliminates <laughs> yeah. the suicide angle. And, and so the fact that something that simple that in 1972, you absolutely could do fingerprint um fingerprinting has been around since the early uh 20th century since the early 1900s um and they sent stuff to sled which is the state law enforcement division in south carolina it's like south carolina's like little state run fbi you know it's their elite level of law enforcement they had a lab that could absolutely uh do fingerprint testing if lancaster didn't feel like it could have done it so um that right there i think would have really eliminated some things or like narrowed the focus, you know, and I, I think it it's um, reasonable to assume that he um, took his own life because his head was in a really bad place. Um, and I could even see where he went in there and was acting weird. And there was some sort of confrontation and he accidentally was killed and, you know, they made it look like he killed himself. You know, I mean, I, there's a lot of possibilities, but I mean, it's, it's abundantly clear that he was not in a good place uh, mentally. And that may have been something that more witnesses might have even said. You know, I mean, his um, assistant coach from high school told me that he knew that he was acting weird and that he was strung out on drugs. Um, you know, so I mean, if that guy had gotten up, I don't know that he would have said that in public, but maybe he would have. And that, and that again would have been more evidence, more um, objective evidence you know, that something was going on with him. So yeah. you know, just the way the, just the way it was handled afterwards was either uh, crooked or bad, <laughs> in yeah. my view. And, and you do hear in the podcast that the family's views and what they think is the, the reason behind his death, which we, we won't get too into. We, we sort of have to, we won't, uh, we won't uh, ruin any sort of endings or anything like that for, for you, but also, another thing that obviously should be considered is this is in the middle of the civil rights era in, you know, a town in the south of America. And the the fact that there was still a, a thing, I believe that you mentioned in the podcast, that white people and black people actually couldn't even be in a couple together. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, you see a black successful man in the who played in the NFL in a small town. It's definitely something that, can also be considered in 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 Jim's passing. Yeah, and and um, so yeah, people can hear that conspiracy theory on the podcast. But like, remember again, this is a guy that you know one of his first big purchases when he got drafted was a uh, canary yellow Lincoln Mark III, which is about I think one of the biggest cars that has ever been made. <laughs> I mean, it's an absolutely enormous car, um, often associated with pimps you know i mean it's just like it's a cool car and it's enormous and he picked uh, arguably the brightest color you could get so i mean he wasn't somebody that was coming back to lancaster and just laying low you know he was around town um he was a social person he loved women he loved to party i would say i mean definitely like hanging out i mean he spent a lot of his time in lancaster shooting pool so he's somebody that was out and about you know and 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 not like laying low or, you know, uh, exactly hiding his presence. So you could see where he could ruffle some feathers by having been out in the broader world, you know, experienced life, like we said, in Baltimore, where people tolerated him because of, you know, what he was able to do on the field. And, you know, maybe uh, coming back to Lancaster and, you know, thumbing his nose a bit at, at the way things were, you know, justifiably but um not everybody would have been thrilled with that yeah and before i let you go uh, brett i want to ask one question now there is one part uh, of the podcast as well that you take the decision to go and confront a person i won't say who um but you go to the decision to confront a person who hasn't been returning your calls and um, because you feel they're vital to the podcast we won't get into the conversation that you had but tell me how did they react when they actually saw you yeah that was interesting because it was uh it was a four-hour ride down there a five-hour meeting that i sat through and then talked to them for about i think it was like eight minutes and like 40 seconds (laughs) and then a four and then a four-hour ride back and actually i had a 
I had a beer and a hamburger before I left because I was <laughs> I was mentally a little bit a little bit shot. At least um, you got something positive out of it. At least I hope the burger I beer something. was good. Yeah. It would have been yeah, the beer was good. It would have been a very disappointing trip if I hadn't gotten something out of it. Um and the person was um actually surprised me wasn't like really shocked and actually was very calm about it um you know which surprised me a little bit and it was a bit nerve-wracking you know because you sit there for a long time during this meeting that the person was involved in um you know just thinking about okay what's the first thing gonna say or what you know how, how aggressive do i need to be or i had no clue what the um had no clue that the meeting would take five hours, you know, so you're sitting there like, wow, this is really dragging on. Um, so that was, uh, that was one of the more challenging parts of it as a reporter, but um, absolutely worth it to try to get, you know, everybody's part of the story in. Yeah. And again, like Pretoria Man, it's a fantastic podcast. It's, de uh, it's definitely a mystery that we probably... I don't know if we'll ever find the truth on or not, but listening to the podcast definitely goes some way of sort of giving you an idea of what happened. Brett did a fantastic job on the series. I was hooked from episode one. Uh, and I think you and all the team that was involved should be really proud of what you did. It was great stuff. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it it, it took forever. And, you know, I was uh, the only person covering sports at that newspaper I worked at. It was a little newspaper. And so, you know, I was just very proud that it, that it got out. I want to thank Davin Coburn, who was the producer on it. And uh, we had some other people that helped us too, um, that, you know, got laid off or had new, you know, found new jobs in the middle of it, but you know, all it, all it contributed uh, important parts to it. And so it's, uh, I'm thrilled that it came out finally and I'm really happy to do anything like this. I, I, you know, makes me feel great that you listened to it and enjoyed it so much. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, would uh, echo your encouragements to your listeners to check it out. Yeah, definitely. I'm um, obviously before we let's go, where can people find the podcast? Yeah, anywhere you listen to podcasts. So it's on Apple or Spotify or the iHeartRadio app, and it's um, Return Man. It's part of the Long Shot series. So there's going to be some more shows in this series. Uh, uh, I think of similar subject, but um, yeah, Return Man. Uh, two words uh, apple or spotify excellent and at the moment uh are you still covering uh every sport for the one paper or have you sort of, sort of focus maybe just on the one or two sports to keep you busy no i've got a new job actually oh, yeah. um, oh so that was a, that was a twist in the middle of the uh so in the middle of the four years that it took um i got a new yeah. job so i work at sports business journal and i cover the business of sports i actually cover uh facilities ticketing and fan experience so i write about like stadiums and and ticketing and uh what sports are going to be like in the covid era oh fantastic and if people want to follow you on uh, twitter or anything where can they get you yeah at brett just one t b-r-e-t number one j-u-s-t all right no b-r-e-t j-u-s-t one t yeah sorry excellent no it's no problem i'm sure we'll be linked on our social pages anyway so they can follow you there too again brett thank you so much for coming on to talk to us today and i look forward to sort of maybe any other work you might do in the future if you look and maybe getting your uh, dipping your toes back in the podcast series uh market again yeah thanks so much and um i appreciate you guys uh listening in ireland i think i find that very cool no especially as a mccormick <laughs> exactly exactly well that's one question i was going to ask him. i didn't want to be too stereotypical asking where the second name come from but where did the do, do you know what part of ireland sort of comes from no clue no clue <laughs> <laughs> gotta gotta do better homework I, well i'm not prepared oh uh, well, come on brad i did my homework on the podcast that's it's just a little give and take here that's all we need but i know sure. that, i think um there was something like uh we were mccore max and got kicked out of scotland for stealing or something and went to oh, okay but yeah i don't i don't i, I wouldn't want to i wouldn't want to 
take that to the grave. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> sure. It's definitely homework for the next time we have you on. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. Maybe. For sure. Uh, guys, that's it for this special episode of the Under Center podcast. Please, if you can, make sure you go and listen to uh, Return the Return Man podcast series. Uh, just search Return Man and you will see it there. Obviously, like you were saying, part with the long shot series. So when you're done with that, there'll be more down the pipeline, I'm sure, which would be definitely worth listening to if you were watching us on youtube please like this video and subscribe to us at the dynamo podcast network that's where you'll find us on spotify apple Podcasts, youtube just search there we'll be there along with so many great other podcasts but thank you so much for listening and tuning in uh, stay safe and we'll speak to you next time